Um, thank you, James, for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, thank you. I hope it's okay to hear me with the, the mask on, but um, we'll have to make the best out of it. Um, I know that you're probably incredibly busy these days. You know, the dry bulk market is on fire. Also, you have some operational issues related to COVID and other logistical issues that you have to deal with. Um, so thank you for coming here today. Um, you know, we do think it's very exciting to talk to a leading dry bulk executive in today's market, um, you know, especially based on the strong performance that we have been seeing, uh, seeing lately. Um, I, I think maybe there's a few topics we would like to cover today. Um, I think um, maybe the, one of the most interesting topics, at least, would be to talk a little bit about the market. Uh, obviously, the market has been incredibly strong uh, over the past 12 months. Uh, we've seen the market you know, tightening considerably. Uh, we now see that uh, asset values are up, rates are up. Um, even over the, the past few days, uh, we see listed tribal companies trading slightly above NAV, even after asset values have been coming up. Um, and still, our DMB research analyst thinks there more, there's more to come in terms of upside for the industry and also in terms of share price uh, performance. Um, and I think also just over the last couple of days, we've seen uh, um, Cape size rates, you know, spot market uh, touching 50,000 K. Uh, and we're probably looking at, uh, you know, one of the best markets in a very long period of time. And even Bloomberg had an uh, article over the weekend talking about uh, the market for shippers in general, not only for dry bulk, but in general, being the strongest since 2008. So, uh, you know, finally, after a very long waiting time, you know, the, the market seems to be strong. Um, and to top it off, it also appears that the uh, order book is quite moderate at the moment, uh, which uh, is uh, encouraging in terms of the sustainability of, of the market. Um, so the question um, you know, from me to you is really, uh, what, what is your take on the market outlook, uh, looking at both the, the short term, um, you know, just the, the next few months, the more medium term and the long term? Are we looking at a new super cycle like we had in the 2000s? Um, or is it something that might be, be more short lived? And, and also, what do you think will be the major drivers of this market? Is it iron ore into the Far East again? Uh, and I'm also interested to hear about your thoughts around minor bulks where you also have some, some exposure. So that was a long intro, but uh, <laughs> I leave it to you. Great. Well, um, thank you very much, and uh, um, thank you for having me here today. Um, yeah, we hit 56,000 today already, so um, I'm going to correct you already, and, and you know, the market is, is very uh, strong in, in, in the Cape size today. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of questions there. Um, I think, you know, if we step back a little bit, um, some of the seeds for this current um, uh, high cycle, you know, have been set for quite some time. I mean, obviously, the market has been poor for, for many, many years. Um, but with COVID and with this sort of COVID rebound, uh, we've seen, you know, really very strong demand. Uh, we saw that picking up strongly last year, actually, in, in China. Um, and we've continued that uh, this year, uh, particularly you know in the states and, and the rest of the uh, the rest of the world. So the demand um, has has looked strong, and I think continues to be strong. Uh, there's some question in in China whether there's slow some some slowdown starting, um, but you know we still see very strong steel prices. Uh, we're up up to uh, six thousand uh, RMB for uh, for steel rods. So you know the prices are are back up to quite a high level. Uh, we see very strong coal prices, coking coal prices, extremely strong. So the demand looks uh, looks pretty healthy. Um, then, if we look at the supply side of commodities, um, you know we've seen continued expansion of iron ore markets. Um, so this year we'll probably see another 30 million tons brought into the market. Um, you know, very positive. This is long term mile, particularly from Brazil, uh, and particularly in the second half of the year. Uh, we've also seen expansion of bauxite trade in, in the larger commodities, so that's probably up 18% this year. Um, and also in the minor box, you know, we've seen very strong uh, grain trades and, and, and general infrastructure demand. So the demand has been strong. We then 
put that against the backdrop of a pretty modest order book. Um, again, in the larger sizes, we've seen roughly 60 or so ships delivered this year, which is quite small versus you know, typical order book. So the order book is quite restrained. But so you know, I'd say all of those have added up to what we've been thinking is going to be a pretty healthy market this year. Now, it's already been supercharged by uh, constraint in, in logistics. So uh, particularly with, with COVID issues, um, we're really seeing you know, incredibly difficult uh, situation with crew changes and the logistics around that, the quarantines around that. I mean, if we look at idle days this year, uh, within the Cape market, we've seen roughly 3.5% more idle days or stationary days than we did last year. And last year was also a COVID. So, you know, if we compare this year with uh, pre-COVID, uh, Cape size on average are waiting for maybe 7% more than they were pre-COVID. So that kind of strain on logistics uh, and the sort of the efficiency of the fleet has really added, uh, uh, added some spice to the market. Uh, and then on top of it, on a short-term basis, you know, we've had uh, a typhoon sitting off, um, off Shanghai today. Uh, that's really added another impetus to the market. So the, the market went up, uh, you know, roughly $10,000 in the last um, couple of days. Uh, and, it, you know, it looks reasonably strong still going forward. So I think short-term logistics and uh, sort of inefficiencies in supply of ships uh, and the way we're using the ships has, has uh, and, and will continue, I think, to provide uh, a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong market on top of basically a fundamental market, which has finally... Uh, strengthened and finally tightened over the last, you know, it's taken 10 years really to, to tighten up from this sort of excess of orders, you know, back in 2009 and 2010. Um, I think that was the sort of small, uh, short and medium. I mean, if we look um, a slightly more medium term to sort of the next couple of years, uh, again, with a, you know, with a rather bullish um, dry bulk ice on, I think it looks pretty positive. Um, I think we still see good demand coming uh, over the next few years as, as COVID. I know, I know we'll have some ups and downs on COVID, but um, you know things like U.S. infrastructure uh, demand and the package there, uh, I think will continue to provide support from a demand perspective to the market. Um, we're seeing you know strong rebound in in India. Um, electricity demand is at a record high in electric in India at the moment. Um, you'll see very low stockpiles actually in, in India, some pretty low stockpiles of, of coal in, in, in China as well. So you know, demand looks set um, to, to, to be pretty strong. Um, next year, uh, Vale have just come out and announced that although their production won't be quite as high as, uh, as they were hoping, it's still maybe up to 375 uh, million tons of capacity. So maybe another 30 million tons or so of capacity will come into the market next year. Uh, and I think that, again, uh, against the backdrop of, of pretty modest ordering, you know, looks looks pretty healthy. Uh, now, obviously, if we look further out, um, you know, then we get a bit more cautious. Um, and um, we definitely see, you know, there is a lot of capacity in shipyards. Um, and so certainly, you know, further out, we have to be a bit more cautious about long-term uh, long demand. Um, one of the topics that we've, you know, we're hearing a lot about today is decarbonisation, and and we feel, along with the um, some of the major miners, that the road to decarbonisation, the road to renewables, is also pretty infrastructure heavy and pretty steel intense, uh, and the infrastructure build uh, for renewables will be um, will also be quite strong and, and will also help with demand on a on a long term basis. Um, so, you know, relatively positive short term, or I would say very positive short term. Um, next couple of years also look good, longer term, more caution, as always. Very good. And I think it's also very well deserved after, you know, living through many years. Right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's about time and hopefully it will be long, long lived. Um, moving on uh, to another big topic of our time, uh, decarbonization, which is also a main focus for this uh, conference. Um, I mean, obviously, you have announced you know very ambitious targets when it comes to decarbonization. Uh, you're also a pioneer when it comes to uh, implementing carbon uh, offset programs. Um, maybe starting with that, um, you know, how does that work, and what has been the sort of market reaction among your clients with regards to those those programs? Yeah, look, I think carbon offsetting, I, I'm sort of very passionate about and very keen on. I mean, just to put it in context, I suppose. 
our philosophy and, and my philosophy really has been um, that, you know, yes, we have these longer term goals, we have 2030, we have 2050, and, and, and we have to do things towards that. But really, you know, we need to, to step on the, um, on the pedal today and to make a difference, we have to act today. So for us, um, you know, and really since I started the business, for the last 10 years, we've been super focused on reducing our, our carbon footprint. We've done all of the things that we've talked about today, improving, um, you know, paint, uh, retrofitting, and uh, op voyage optimization, you know, energy management, all of the, you know, all of the tricks of the trade, you know, we've done. And, and it's been very successful as part of our new buildings as well. We have some very efficient uh, uh, ships. And, and <clears throat> we recently did a study with, um, with AVS who, you know, confirmed that we've reduced since 2008 our carbon intensity by 42 percent so it's a big you know it's a, it's a big target already and that's actually our IMO goal which we've you know we've re we've reached now so you know I think the the onus on the ship owner is to um, is to to act now and to reduce their their footprint today so kind of our second part of our decarbonization story is to then go and do those those improvements we've done over the last 10 years kind of repeat them now over the next few years so we are you know, upgrading even further our existing ships. Um, again, with some of the same old technology, there's even better paint now. Um, there's better voyage optimization. There's better electrical management. And then we're also adding on um, a, a whole series of, of, uh, of, of energy-saving devices. So uh, today we're testing a, a kite off South Africa, uh, a power kite. We've got uh, rotors. We've got wings. We've got solar power. You know, all of these... Um, additions to try and reduce our, our carbon footprint, which I think will make a difference in the next, you know, uh, one or two years. We'll start to make a difference. So, you know, we're very positive about that. But what we know is that we're not going to get to carbon zero, you know, for quite a long time. Um, we have committed by 2030 to have a, a zero carbon vessel, and I'm sure we'll have that earlier than 2030. So our view is that in the interim, we need to uh, we need to offset, and we can do that immediately. So we've now started offsetting voyages. Um, we build up quite a big uh, portfolio of of nature-based solutions and of of um, of renewable solutions uh, for offsets. And we're now offering our customers and encouraging our customers to to offset uh, all of their voyages. Um, so you know, today on our website, you can go in, you can choose uh, which project you want to offset. We'll calculate the amount of tons that the voyage. Uh, the voyage uh, produces, uh, and then we'll help you offset that that volume. And I think you know that's my goal is to encourage customers to do it. And frankly, if they don't do it, we're going to end up doing it ourselves. But I, I think it's a, a joint journey, and and it's something that we can do today, uh, and something that we need to do today because we can talk about 2030 for quite a while. And as I said, we need to do that. Um, but I see uh, offsetting as a as an interim measure, and it's a way of of pulling carbon out of out of the atmosphere today. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think you know another big topic is obviously the future of propulsion, uh, and I think the jury is still out there. A lot of uh, clients that we cover they have different views on this. You know, if it's uh, dual fuel LNG, um, LPG, um, ammonia, hydrogen. Um, I, I think yourself you even looked into nuclear. You know early stage, but you know, at least you did something you explored. Um, what are your thoughts around this? Yeah, look, I think we're, we're following on with what you know, most people are saying. Um, I, I think we, we, you know, we look very hard at LNG and, and obviously it's a, a reduction in CO2, but I think from our perspective, uh, we're going to concentrate on that 20% reduction by, by um, focusing today on, on delivering uh, the fuel saving that I mentioned, and then offsetting the balance, uh, and then in terms of future fuel, I think we're more um, looking towards the the final solution where we can go straight to to zero uh, to zero carbon. There's a huge amount of work to do. I mean, I think the technology is coming on on you know quicker than the supply of, of particular ammonia, um, but I you know I think things will move move sooner. Certainly from a, a shipping point of view, I think we will be able to order. Uh, ammonia ammonia ships rel relatively soon, um, and then we need to concentrate on on where we're going to get the supply from that, and that's a a huge ask. I, I was seeing a a Lloyd's article just this week, which was saying that you know if if um, if 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 thirty percent of the world's fleet 
converts to, to ammonia, we'll have to double our ammonia production. The whole world's ammonia production will have to double. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a huge ask. It's going to be hugely expensive. Um, but I think it's possible, and I think we are you know, beholden to get on with it and, and, and do it as best as we can. So um, you know, looking forward to hearing um, where, where, where the, the combined uh, policies are coming for support from people like you know, Singapore and MPA in terms of actually bunkering stations for ammonia and, and how, the, how this will um, develop is, is going to be super exciting. Very good. Um, you touched upon the COVID situation and also the situation on the cruise and the logistical issues, you know, briefly earlier. Uh, I understand that's a big issue for all ship owners, including yourself, and something that you're very focused on. Um, um, do you think we will see a solution soon? You know, what are you doing uh, about it, you know, in-house, you know, to mitigate the situation? Yeah, look, uh, you know, COVID has obviously been a, a terrible problem, you know, for the whole world. Um, you know, in our shipping environment, uh, it's becoming tougher, um, and you know, it's 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 frustrating. It's extremely difficult to to get crew off our ships at the moment. I mean, these are crew who are who have been at sea for six months, are are are, are COVID free, uh, have actually by nature been in quarantine for the last six months. Um, but we can't, you know, we can't get them off very easily. Um, so we're really trying to work with everyone we can. Um, you know, as an example, we have a ship in, in Europe at the moment where we have crew which need to come off um, and we can't get them off. There's, we're, we're going around different ports trying to persuade uh, their Chinese crew. They have to do a, a three, three weeks quarantine before they can be repatriated to China. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, most European ports will not let them come off or they'll let them come off for seven days and then won't let them come back. So, you know, it's a big problem. It's a logistical, uh, logistical problem. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a mental health problem for, for our seafarers. So we're very, uh, we're very wary of it. We're working very hard with them. We're trying, trying our best. Um, you know, everyone's trying their best, but it's, uh, it's a tough situation. And, um, you know, it, again, you know, very positive that the countries are, are slowly recognizing this and, and coming up with different specific solutions and I think Singapore is also working you know strongly towards that to allow us a, a solution in terms of getting crew and off and, and also going towards vaccination of crew which is also another you know big issue which we need to speed them up. Very good. Um, talking a little bit about Burger Bulk you know um, obviously it's been an incredible growth story you know uh, it was a mid-sized player you know from the outset now it's industry giant you know with one of the largest fleets in the in the world in terms of dry bulk um, and you managed to to deliver that growth in a market that has not always been um, you know easy to put it put it that way right so uh, I can imagine there's been a lot of uh, you know, hard work going into that that process and um, I, I, I think at the same time you know a lot of uh, dry bulk players have been struggling um, I know there's a few things that are sort of particular about the way you run the company, uh, in terms of uh, operational excellence, in terms of uh, financial prudence, in terms of uh, having a uh, focus on long-term charters, um, and just a very, very focused strategy. But, um, you know, what is, what is your perspective on, on this? You know, uh, what, if I may call it, what has been the sort of secret sauce, you know, uh, you know behind, uh, you know, building the company to where, where it is today? Well, you know, thank you for that, and I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how um, you know secret source source, <laughs> source it is. But um, look, we, you know, I, I kind of started the business um, in 2007. We had we had 12 ships, and you know, I think I had a simple objective to to try and build a uh, build a business. I'm I'm kind of an entrepreneur at heart, and I like building uh, businesses. And and we wanted to build a a business which was you know really offering you know a safe efficient and reliable freight and and you know we've stuck to that through the last 10 years uh, our customers appreciate that um, I think one of our, our big areas that we've really concentrated on a lot is is, is our internal management of the ships um, I think shipping and and management of your own ships is is a you know it's the soul of shipping it's the base of shipping um, and we are very we're very close to our ships and and uh, uh, we like our crew. You know, I think our crew work incredibly hard in in tough situations and and deliver you know a great product for us, um, which our customers appreciate. 
Um, on top of the, the management side of it, it means that we are closer to the ships. It, it helps us with our operational performance, our voyage optimization, um, really kind of driving results in a, in a tough market in particular. It's very uh, important to eke out that extra, uh, that extra return through efficient uh, performance, uh, which I think we've done very well. Um, look, you know, I think shipping is a, um, you know, it's a difficult business. Uh, it's a details business. I, I often say that I'm, you know, pretty risk averse and conservative, you know, but the reality is, you know, I kind of build a business from 12 to 80, we're having our, our 86 just ship is delivering next week. And, you know, you have to take, <laughs> you have to take risks within that. Um, but we try to make them, uh, you know, well considered, um, prudent, as you said. Um, you know, I have a great team who've supported us through the whole thing. Some of the some of the guys have been um, uh, with 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 me since since the start. Um, so you know, big thanks to them. You know, I, I think they they're a lot of the source as well. Um, and also big thanks to all our, our banks here. Uh, it's been really helpful to have uh, a strong finance uh, um, kind of background and and support from from the banks. Um, we often say. You know, we like to, you know, we do what we say on the packet. Uh, and I think by and large, we've managed to deliver what we say we're going to do over the last, you know, 10, 12 years. Uh, and I think that's helped um, support. So, we've, you know, we've managed to grow the business, you know, I I internally on our, on our own funding um, with, with the bank, you know, with the sort of support of banks. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big process, um, but it's been fun. And it's, uh, you know, it's very rewarding. So, yeah, it's been a good, good, good time. Very good. And uh, what do you think is next? Will you grow at the same pace going forward? And you know, if you were to grow, you know, what would be the focus in terms of vessel segments and and, and overall commercial strategy? Yeah. Look, I think um, it's a it's a good question. It's one one I ask myself a lot, and uh, you know, we debate a lot. Um, you know, I think one of the the other sort of areas of of success, and you mentioned it, is sort of being financially prudent and and sort of. You know, ultimately, you, you you do have to, but you you know, ultimately, you do have to make a call on the market and decide uh, when is a good time to invest and when is not a good time to invest. So, you know, is it a good time to invest as rapidly we uh, as we have in the past? You know, I'm not so sure. Immediately, um, we bought you know roughly ten ships last year uh, at at what I would consider a low point in the cycle. So, you know, we're kind of absorbing those at the moment, um, and whether. We would expand, you know, quite the same rate now. Um, I doubt it. I think we've got uh, a lot to do with decarbonisation, um, and so probably our, our our emphasis, our growth, you know, for the next years is is again around decarbonisation and and where we go, you know, where we go with that. Um, but we have built uh, over the last few years quite a, a big sort of handy and supermax uh, business, um, and that's an area which we really like. Uh, I think. Um, the the macro and the long term looks looks good in that sector as well. So, you know, we'll probably continue to expand uh, in that and and sort of develop that business as well as as our as our as our main business. And I'm sure um, I'm sure we'll continue to keep keep growing and expanding. Sounds good. Uh, last question. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if you look at the listed dry bulk universe, um, a lot of companies have traded up two to three hundred percent over the last twelve months. Um, strong investor interest again in shipping. We even saw a couple of IPOs, small ones, you know, in the dry bulk, but still successful ones. Um, you know, is that something that you would ever consider, or uh, is it private, private forever for for Burger Bulk? Uh, I thought a capital markets guy would probably ask me <laughs> ask me that question. Um, look, I think again, we've we've um, you know, being private has, has served us well over the last years um, and so you know whether we would um, you know change change that I think is unlikely I think uh, you know good to to stick what you know you do best and and continue down the same path um, but you know it's, it's fascinating watching the the public markets um, you know obviously assets prices have gone up as as well as as equity so you know how that kind of pans out in the future um, will be interesting um, you know obviously you know, access again to public market money, um, you know, becomes a concern again from a, 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 an owner's perspective, whether, 
uh, that sees a rush to you know rush to ordering or unnecessary ordering at, at this stage. So you know that will be another area to watch. But uh, I think we'll probably stick to our uh, our day-to-day -day business and, and keep going as we've as we've gone. Thank you, James. Pleasure having you, and thanks for your insight. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.